morning, everybody, and welcome to this University of Buckingham interview uh, with Michael Morpurgo. And it's an absolute thrill, obviously, to have Michael with us for a whole hour this evening. And uh, this is an opportunity for you to ask questions. I'm already inundated uh, with questions and I'm going to do my best to get through as many as possible. And uh, can I say that this is also an opportunity um, to learn about the rich tapestry of uh, work that uh, Michael has taken place in, which includes farms for city children, which he will explain and I'll ask him about as we go through in the first half of the evening, uh, talking about uh, Michael's life and, and, and writing and, and screenplays and, uh, and drama. Um, War Horse being uh, the most successful play, correct me Michael if I got this wrong, in the entire national history of the National Theatre. I, I, I believe so, yes. I think, um, um, I think nothing has surpassed it in terms of either length or numbers of people, and certainly not in the amazement of the people who've seen it. Um, at some, something like 2.3 million uh, people seen, have seen the physical play, which is just uh, extraordinary and very wonderful. Um, now, uh, Michael, because he is in as deep Devon as you can possibly uh, get uh, to, uh, and uh, the con connectivity is not what it is in uh, much of the rest of the country. This will be one of the very, very few uh, talks in the series that I'm afraid we can hear uh, Michael, and Michael is there, but we're not going to be able visually uh, to see him, and, uh, and we wouldn't have anything like a reliable image. Instead, there are a whole series of different images uh, of Michael and his work that are coming up on screen. But let's get straight down uh, to it. I'm also going to be asking for donations for farms for city children. I cannot think uh, of a, a better charity. There are many outstanding charities, as good as, but none uh, are better uh, than this. And we'll explain about that. But let's um, uh, let me ask uh, Michael to begin uh, just um, narrating for us uh, his wonderful uh, song of gladness. Michael, welcome. Oh, it's lovely. Lovely to be here. Thank you, Anthony. Um, I, I wrote this, I suppose, because I'd been locked down like so many other people have been. And um, I have this routine in the morning where I go into the vegetable garden first thing in my pajamas and pick some kale um, for, to make a smoothie. I'm not going to get too domestic about all this, but that's why I go outside. And every morning, waiting for me beyond the vegetable garden, um, was this blackbird. And the blackbird would sing or call to me and um, I kind of I got the impression that he wanted me to reply so I started replying and a conversation sort of went on and then I thought well what is he singing about and this is what I wrote because I thought it is what I felt most deeply about where we are in the world about us song of gladness I've been talking every morning to blackbird telling him why we are all so sad at the moment. He sits on his branch and listens. It was Blackbird's idea. He sang it out this morning at dawn from his treetop in the garden to Fox, half asleep behind the garden shed. She thought it a good idea too. It was a wake-up call. Fox was on her feet at once and trotting through Bluebell Wood where she barked it to deer who ran off across the stream. Kingfisher was there, Otter and Dipper too. They heard and piped it on, and Swallow swooped down over the meadow and passed it on to cows waiting to go into their milking and to sheep resting quietly under the hedge with her lambs in the corner of the dew-damp field. And they all agreed, bleating it out to bees already busy at their flowers, to weaving spiders and grasshoppers and scurrying mice, Trees heard sheep calling to the whole flock of them and waved their budding leaves in wild enthusiasm. High above, the clouds wandered through the skies driven by wind, and wind took Blackbird's idea over the cliffs 
across heaving seas where gulls and albatross cried it out, and whales and dolphins and porpoises heard it, and whaled it and whooped it down into the deep, where turtles listened, and they too loved the idea. So did plankton, and every fish and crab and sea urchin and whelk. They all whispered it was a fine notion, the best they had ever heard. And the whisper went out over the sea on the curling waves to the shores of Africa, where lions roared their approval, and elephants trumpeted it. Leopards yawned it, water buffalo belched it, wild dogs yelped it, wildebeest murmured it out across the savannah. Then storm lifted the idea up over rainforests, where rain took it and poured it down on gorillas in the mist, on chimpanzees in their sleeping nests and Crocodile swished his tail in his swamp and clapped his great jaws shut, smiling at the very thought of it. Howler monkeys and gibbons echoed their calls loud over all the earth. They are that loud. And then, from far up high, Sun heard it too and shone it down over deserts where Oryx stamped her foot, impatient to be getting on with it and doing it. She loved the idea that much. Even Camel, who rarely joined in anything, thought this was the best and most beautiful idea he had ever heard. Back in the garden, Blackbird waited till everyone was ready. He began to sing. And the whole carnival of animals, every living thing on this good earth, joined in until the globe echoed with the joy of it. Blackbird was very pleased. But I was still lost in sadness as I heard the earth singing around me. It was a song of forgiveness. I knew that. So I asked Blackbird if I was allowed to join in, and he sang his answer back to me. Why do you think we are doing this, you silly man? We want you and yours to be happy again. Only then will you treat yourselves right. And you'll treat us and the world right again, as you know you should. Only then we'll all be well. Sing, silly man, sing, sing. Our song is your song. Your song is our song. So I sang. We all sang. Sang away our sadness. In every house and flat and cottage we clapped and sang. In every hut and tent, in every palace and hospital and prison. And they heard and we heard our song of gladness echoing about us in glorious harmony across the universe. Wonderful. Um, and what a great way to start off uh, this In Conversation with Michael Morpurgo, that uh, very freshly written and beautifully written and, and wonderfully narrated uh, poem. Thank you, Michael, very much indeed. Thank we have you. many, many young uh, people, uh, many children listening to this, many uh, adults, a uh, huge number. Can you just tell us something about your own childhood, which I think was mixed with uh, happiness and sadness and uh, memories? Yes, I guess it was. I, I think like most childhoods, probably, um, most children uh, listening to this would, and adults indeed would, understand that. Um, I I was a, a child um, born in Hertfordshire, baby, and um, spent my first years um, really being evacuated right up to the north because it was safer away from things. But anyway, eventually came back to live in London and so grew up in a, in a rather strange situation. It was post-war London. Um, I didn't hear any bombs falling, that had all happened. But what there was around me was a terrific sense of gloom and uh, and depression after all everyone had gone through six years of trauma not a few months of being shut in but they'd really gone through grief and loss which of course people have been going through at the moment recently and uh, an extraordinary time um, of uncertainty and anxiety and mostly bad news um, and so the adults were very low and depressed and London was grey and it was full of smog and I went to the primary school and um, it, 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 it was one of these schools where it was like that in those days, an LCC primary school where everything was um, about fee.
fear. You you learned through fear. You got the ruler if you did things wrong or got stood in the corner. I didn't enjoy school much. I liked playtime. Then my parents rather wonderfully, and I'm not, never sure quite why, they moved us all out to the Essex coast to a place called Bradwell um, on sea. And we had a big ramshackle cold house uh, where my brother Peter and I and my, my two stepbrothers, my stepbrother and stepsister, we all grew up there in this ramshackle old place, played in the sort of Nissen hut in the garden and picked apples and played ping pong in a barn. And it was, it was happy days for about four or five years. And then my parents decided they'd send me away to school. Which was, um, it was, it was. I understand why they did it. It was what most middle class children had to do, uh, and off you went. It was kind of what happened. It was a rite of passage, really. I didn't know that at the time. I just knew I was being sent away from my paradise of a place, and I didn't like it. So I ended up in a boarding school in Sussex, um, above Ashdown Forest, and I remember there was a literary thing happened there because I think it was where um, Pooh Bear um, played poo sticks down in Ashdown Forest over a bridge. My parents told me that, and I think they thought it would be a wonderful notion for me to have that in my head, but it, it wasn't like that at all. It was a school where it was very rigorous and, um, again, more punishments. <laughs> it was that sort of a school. Um, and I was um, very homesick a lot of the time, um, particularly at the beginning of terms. Um, terms were long, 14 weeks, and you didn't see your mum and dad. It was a very strange sort of world. Entirely male, except for a matron. And was very kind to us, but um, and there were good things about it. Um, I liked my sport. I liked playing my cricket and my rugby. I was hopeless at my um, my work, um, mostly because I was frightened. And there was not, nothing more inclined to put children off learning than anxiety and fear, and that's that's what happened a lot. And so I used to come quite way down the form orders and get lots of minuses and this sort of thing. It was it was bad reports. So anyway, I went off to a school which was remarkable. Um, in the sort of shadow of Canterbury Cathedral, a place called King's School, Canterbury, very ancient, ancient public school, and we wore wing collars and black jackets and pinstripe trousers and boaters, and um, lived this strange, strange world, Victorian world, I suppose, but in many ways wonderful. The wonderful thing about it was that the teaching was terrific in many places, the music was wonderful, the architecture was stunning, um, and although I was still rather miserable in terms of not having the mum around the place, um, I, I settled into it and um, became one of those uh, schoolboys, I think, who reveled in everything it had to offer, uh, the sport and, and the music and, and the good teaching. But I was then thought to be a bit of a dumbo um, and, and not, not going to do much at university. So they were advising me to go, well, you'll be good for the army. So I ended up at Sandhurst for a very brief time, um, which was in many ways wonderful because I learned about friendship, comradeship. I'd never written wars if I hadn't been there, that's for sure. And then uh, I met my wife, Claire, and um, she asked me very straight questions about what I was doing this thing for, and I didn't give very satisfactory answers. I think it's because I was 18 or 19 and very naive, and um, I hadn't really thought it through. So eventually I came out of the army and I went to university and became a teacher. And after 10 years of teaching, my wife decided, um, no, that's not true. My wife, no, no I decided. Um, that it would be a wonderful thing uh, to do something very different with education because I was used to classroom teaching uh, and so was she and we had both gleaned uh, the fact that you can only teach children so much within a school and that there's a huge wide world out there um, which is the most wonderful resource for children particularly children who don't get to um, be in such a place and my wife had grown up loving the countryside um, and I'd grown up as I told you on the Essex coast and I had my moment of paradise with the animals and uh, the, the, the nature up there and I'd, I'd, I'd sort of become close to um, the wind and to seeing hares and all that world of, uh, of, the, of the marshes by the sea and the sea wall and Claire had come down to Devon when she was little and she'd spent um, holiday after holiday when she was between the age of about 7 and 12 at this little place called Iddesley in the middle of nowhere, which is where I'm speaking to you from. Because she decided that we were going to start a project, called it Farms for City Children, and we were going to move down here. And with the money, her publisher father, she had an extraordinary man called Alan Lane who began Penguin Books, who was her daddy. He had just died and left us some money, so we started this charity called Farms for City Children, um, bought a rather large house and a bit of a farm, and made a relationship with a local farmer and started to invite primary school children down from London, and then Birmingham, Bristol, Manchester, all over. 
and that's what we've been doing now for uh, 45 years and uh, 100,000 children. I mean, I have three farms um, and uh, we are in lockdown, just um, as so many charities and businesses are. So it's, it's a difficult time. But that, in brief, is um, a short autobiography. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. And welcome, uh, everyone who's just joined us. This is the University of Buckingham Great Minds series. Michael or Pergo has been talking about his life. Uh, you will have noticed that you're not seeing Michael. That's because he is, as he's just said, at Idlesley in the very depths of uh, Devon and uh, Exmoor. Or is it Dartmoor? Dartmoor. 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 Between Exmoor, Exmoor and Dartmoor. And I have to say, if I can, Anthony, I think it's a really good thing you're not seeing me. Um, uh, and my voice isn't great, but it's a great deal better than what I look like. So I'm very happy that I'm invisible. <laughs> and uh, uh, totally uh, understood. And Michael was there talking uh, about the extraordinary charity he started with Claire. And uh, it would be wonderful if uh, some of you were moved to make uh, donations at this very difficult time uh, to that uh, charity, uh, as indeed I will be doing on behalf of the university. Now, uh, Michael, your extraordinary, fertile um, mind that sees the world in your very special way. Uh, when did this happen? I know that your experiences, as I think it was the Abbey School that was unhappy, mm -hmm. helped inform, inform Butterfly Lion. Uh, yes. What was it about your early experiences um, that got you into the game of, of writing? Um, well, it, I suppose it, it, it was because I was alone quite a lot of the time. Um, that's not to say I, I didn't sort of get on with people. I did. But I found myself quite early on, because I was away from home, I think, um, not joining in the world, but looking at it, standing back and looking at it. Um, and if, I, I can't analyze myself, but I think that's really how it all began. I felt separate from the world. Funnily enough, I love to join in. I love team sports. I love rugby. I love cricket. But even then, I always felt a bit of a, an, an outsider. Um, and I think that maybe as a writer, you have to be that. You have to stand back. You have to think about it. And I didn't have any notion I was going to be a writer at all because as I think I mentioned I was thought to be relatively um, uninteresting and dim intellectually and uh, in, in this sort of direction creatively. Um, and it was only really because... I had one or two teachers, not many, but one or two teachers at every institution I went to who did do something wonderful. And they actually did what my mother did, but they didn't know it. I had this extraordinary mother who was an actor. I had a, my real daddy was an actor and my mum was an actor. And my real daddy went off. It wasn't his fault. He, someone else came along and um, came to live with my mother. And so he was ousted. And I didn't know him at all when I was growing up. I can tell you more about that later. But the, the, the truth was that they were, um, they were both um, actors. And they, they left me, I think, with the idea that storytelling was really good. And my daddy never was there. But my mum used to come and sit in our bed. Um, Peter's, we, Peter and I used to sleep in the same sort of attic room up in this great big house. And she'd come and she was very busy. She had two other children to look after and a husband who was not the easiest person in the world. So she made time to come and sit and be with us and read books, stories, poems. And here's the thing. She was very beautiful. Everyone's mother is beautiful. But she had the most beautiful voice. She went to Rada so she could read poems. And she always read these poems and these stories, only the ones that she loved. And that's what really worked. What you knew was that this was a very special moment because she was passing on to, to us what she loved. And she did it in, in, in such a persuasive So she would be reading De La Mer and Tennyson and this sort of thing. And, and she would be, read Kipling stories. I mean, just those stories. I grew up really thinking The Elephant's Child was the funniest story I ever I think it is actually one of the funniest and most beautiful stories I've ever heard, The Elephant's Child from the Just So Stories. But she would read this, the, these stories. And I caught the flavor of that um, and, and the joy of it and the, uh, the way I could just lose myself in a story. I loved that. I really loved it. And then I went off to school and I discovered that my school, people weren't interested in telling stories anymore by and large. They just wanted you to learn how to spell the words and to punctuate and do something called parsing. Um, and actually, with, which led to testing. And so there was all this sort of stuff, which I really didn't like at all. So stories kind of lost their edge for me. 
But I was lucky because at every single school, there was one person. In my primary school, it was a lady who came in. She used to do the library, I think, as a volunteer. And she used to read stories. And then when I got to my prep school, there was one teacher from Australia, I remember. And I do remember because he was very big and he was a rugby player. But he also read stories and he read them with great power. And then I got um, a man called Mr. Sopwith, I remember, at Canterbury. used to sort of... He said something to me wonderful one day. He said, you know, you don't read enough, Michael, and you don't read enough. I'm going to give you my copy of Wordsworth. I was about 16, I think, and I was only really interested in rugby at this stage. And um, he said, you know, there's more to life than rugby. And he gave me this book. And I remember going out with it and looking at it. It was a very dusty old thing and a tiny, tiny print. But I read it from cover to cover. And what made me do it was because he really loved these things himself. He'd read me one or two. And I liked him. And uh, and then I got, later on, I went to university at King's College in London. And uh, there was a man called Garman's Way who taught me English. And he sat on the corner of his desk in a very ill-fitting tweed suit, I seem to remember, and smelling of pipe tobacco. And he um, read us Beowulf. And you, it was just like, it was it was quite like, you, I'd look at him and it was a bit like my mother sitting on the bed because that's what it was like. He was reading Beowulf with all the majesty of the language and the extraordinary rhythms in the story. And you knew this man loved it. He absolutely loved it. So I loved it. And I, I think that's what I learned. So when I found myself, which I did later on, being a teacher, I knew what worked already. What worked is that you never, never um, taught anything you didn't really want to teach. And when I read stories, I never read them the story unless I liked it, loved it first. And then I read it with all my heart and with all my soul because the one thing you do know with children after a time when you're teaching them is that you have to mean it. Pretending isn't any good. There'll and be many, so, I was going to say, many children, many uh, teachers, many parents uh, uh, listening in, and they'll all be, I'm sure, um, intrigued by your emphasis on on stories uh, mm. and uh, uh, and reading out uh, loud. Um, uh, and then um, you wrote 1974-75, It Never uh, Rained, Living Poets, yeah. Long Way From Home. Um, yeah. Were they your, but they weren't your first books. T tell us about how they came to be. They came to be, they came to be written really because um, I, had, I remember I was teaching year sixes in a, uh, one of those outside classrooms, which was a sort of temporary place. I think they called a mobile classroom, but it never moved, just sat in the, uh, in, in, in the playground. And, um, I used to finish the day. I had this wonderful head teacher who told me, <laughs> told me, uh, told us all in the school, uh, the last half of every day, she said, and she's dead right, and I hope the Minister of Education is listening. The last half of every day in the primary school, she said, don't try and teach them. They're too tired. And you know something? You're too tired to teach them. So here's what you do. <laughs> you read them a story or tell them a story. And here's the other thing you don't do. You don't ask them a comprehensive a comprehension question afterwards you just read the story mean it with all your heart let them go and then they'll walk out of school thinking about it dreaming about it asking themselves question about it and it was the most wonderful advice from this um uh, head teacher and i i did that and um i was doing it one day and i began a story which i thought was okay i was reading and i looked up and i saw all these 30 odd children looking out the window not remotely interested and, some of them picking their noses, it wasn't a pleasant sight. And I thought, they're not enjoying this. And so I read it with much more fervent enthusiasm and nothing really woke up. And I went home, asked Claire, who was by this time also a teacher, saying, what will I do, what will I do? She said, well, don't go in and bore them again. You already bored them enough. Clearly it didn't work. Go in and tell them one of your stories. I said, well, I don't really, I need to tell stories to my own children. She said, well, they're fine, I've listened to them. And anyway, she said, you're quite a good liar. So. What I did the next day, I went in there at three and I made up a story overnight and I went in and I but it, I screwed my courage, as the great bard said, to the sticking place. And I stood up there in front of these 30 children, year sixes. And you can imagine what their faces looked like when I said I was going to tell them the story I'd made up. Anyway, I did it. And the lovely thing was that after 10 minutes, they were all agog and their mouths broke and there was this wonderful silence. I thought, I can do this stuff. And actually, I really enjoy doing this stuff. So I didn't end it. I got to the end of the day and the bell went and I hadn't finished the story. I said, I'll come back tomorrow and tell you. And we, we did a sort of soap all the way through the week. And the head teacher came in at the end because she'd heard about Mr. Morpurgo's story. And she came come and sat at the back. I remember 
sitting there looking at me. And I was slightly nervous, but anyway, I was locked into the story this time, so I just told it. And she came up to me after she said, Michael, that was, that was wonderful. That was really wonderful. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to write it out and give it to me on Monday morning. So here I was, age, well, I was 28 or something, being told by, talked by his teacher like a 10-year-old. But I did, I wrote it out, and she sent it to some publisher called Macmillan. And um, they wrote me this wonderful letter, which I still have somewhere, which was something like, Dear Mr. Morpingo, um, we just read your story. Could you write four more? And we'll put it in a little book called It Never Rained, because that was the name of the first story. And, um, uh, and we'll pay you £75. And so I thought, I read this letter, and I thought, eat your heart out, roll dial. And um, that's how it all began, really. And from that start, the stories just tumbled out of you? They did, really. You know, I mean, I, I really do just love telling stories. I'm, I'm, in a, I'm like a bear with a sore back, unless I'm either dreaming one up or no, I'm actually writing it. I mean, funny enough to bring this right up to the present day, just jumping ahead, and I'm sure we'll go back and forth a bit. But during this sort of lockdown, I've been in this little place, this wonderful little place that we live in in, in Devon, and uh, we haven't moved out of here now for 11 weeks because we're sort of the wrong side of 75 we're not supposed to. Um, and I'd been doing, I was asked by my publisher who said, what we really want you to do is to, is to retell the tales of Shakespeare as Charles Lamb did a long, long time ago because they need doing and um, people don't read Charles Lamb like they used to. Would you, would you do that? And so I'm, I've got this wonderful project where I come to my bed every day and I'm just retelling these extraordinary stories, some of which are immensely complicated. The more, the, some of these comedies are so entangled in disguises and, um, in, and it, it, it's just wonderful to be able to sort of tease them out and tell the story. So yes, there's a great sort of leap from those first stories in the classroom at Wickhambury in Kent when I was teaching in a primary school uh, to now. And there have been, I don't know, was it 140 books in between? Um, all sorts, uh, some picture books, some novels, short, long, uh, animal stories, war stories. It's whatever. I tend to sort of, I don't know, you know the inside, and many of you will know this, there are probably some farmers there. Um, you'll know that hens, um, I know you're all thinking, what is he talking about now? Well, I'll tell you. Um, when a hen lays an egg, uh, there isn't just one waiting to come out. There's like a little queue of them. And they're, they're the tiny, tiny, tiny little one right at the back. And then there's a slightly the bigger one, and then there's a slightly the bigger one. And the one that is produced that day, which you can have for your breakfast, is the sort of completed thing. And that's the story when it comes out. It's all, it's got its shell, it's got its yolk, that's the entire story. But the other ones are just kind of forming as bits of ideas and bits of notions. And, and gradually, gradually, they seem to take shape and form. And I love that process. So, I mean, I, I, I'm going to finish this, this book now, this Shakespeare retelling book in a, in a couple of weeks' time. And I know there's another little egg queuing up. I don't want to talk about it because it's pretty unformed. Well, um, can I just say to everyone, we're getting on for a thousand people now listening. Um, we have masses of questions. Do please uh, send in to the University of Buckingham. You should have the details, everybody. Um, I'm just going to ask you just two more uh, questions, then we're going to come over to the questions in the second sure. half. Um, just pick one of um, four literary influences on you, namely Sean Rafferty, Ernest Hemingway, Paul uh, Gallico, uh, and Ted Hughes. Um, I, and yeah, there are, I, you know, I think, Anthony, there were two really big ones. There are all those, absolutely. Um, uh, but the two that stay with me, and it is this, it's, it's the stuff you grow up with, really. The first book I ever really read that I knew was good and that I loved, because I read quite a lot of things, which just to keep the page turning, I used to read in the Blight, and mostly because I was not allowed to at school, so I would read it. And I loved it in the sense because it was a bit of a hidden thing, and you turn the page with a, a torch under the blankets, and I liked all that. But the first book that I ever read um, that I knew was well written was Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. And Robert Louis Stevenson became really my writing mentor. In a way, he's the person I most want to be, because this was a man who turned uh, his talent to, yes, telling extraordinary children's yarns, and the characters are never simple. A villain is not a villain. It's a nuanced villain, and therefore it's believable. So Long John Silver was someone, you know, we were absolutely, 
with that lovely little boy on the Hispaniola over overhearing this 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 terrible thing. These pirates were going to do this mutiny, and they were going to cut people's throats. And anyway, I, I was in that I was in that barrel with that little boy, and I just remember thinking, I believe this, I believe this, and that's why I wanted to read because I believed every word, and I could see it in my mind's eye as I was reading it. So I grew up with Robert Louis Stevenson, and I learned later this is a man who could write poetry, he could write adult novels, he could write travel books. He was just a, a wonderful, wonderful, not good at a wordsmith, he was a great writer. And so I, I felt I knew him uh, intimately, really. Um, I read biography after biography about him when I got older. In fact, I, uh, he, he's helped me so much in my own writing that even the method that he used to write his books, I mean, physically, I copied. There's a wonderful photograph of him lying on a, a bed or being propped up on a bed, as I am now, actually with lots of pillows behind me, with his knees drawn up in front of him. It was in his last years in, on an island called Samoa. And it is exercise book on his knees, and he was scribbling. And uh, I remember at one point I was finding it really hard to write at a desk, and I was aching my joints and my shoulder was aching. And I asked a dear friend of mine, a neighbor friend of mine, uh, a fairly decent poet called Ted Hughes, I said, well, what, do, what do you do? What do you do? Uh, does it hurt you? And he said, no, no, no. He said, I, it used to. And I now stand at a lectern. And uh, he showed me. And uh, I thought, well, if that's good for Ted Hughes. It's good for me. So I, I got myself a lectern and I stood there. And of course, it hurt my feet. So that didn't work either. And then I read this book um, about wonderful Robert Louis Stevenson. I saw him there, relaxed on his bed. And I thought, well, he wrote Treasure Island. I'll try that. And, I, and it, it's lovely. And I still do it. But exercise book on my knees and everything is relaxed. Your shoulders are relaxed. And there's a great bonus, which Robert Louis Stevenson didn't write about, but it, it does mean that when you get fed up or you run out of ideas, you just go to sleep. It's easy. Um, so he's my number one hero. Uh, and then I suppose briefly, it is... Very briefly on your second one. Ted Hughes. Yeah. Simply, simply because yeah. this man had a power of language, which I, um, I, could never, uh, I could never imitate or get near. But if I had the command of language and ideas and the music of poetry... Um, and his sense, enormous um, sense of uh, our, our literary traditions. Um, his poetry and Robert Louis Stevenson's storytelling, that's, that's the writer I'd like to be, a combination of those two. And how close did Ted Hughes let you get to him? Well, he was a really, really good friend. I have no idea how close it was. I think it was closer than a lot of people, simply because we worked in very different parts of writing. Um, he was a formidable writer and a formidable human being, but he was also very gentle. He was very kind, and he loved encouraging younger writers, which I was at the time. Um, and I, I, he was very, he was very vulnerable. He loved coming to read to the children who came down to the farms from London or Birmingham or Bristol, come in an evening, and he'd, he'd sit there and he'd read his poems, and he loved it, but he was really nervous about it. <laughs> and here I was thinking, oh, these children don't know what a great poet this guy is, and he's looking. Unbelievably nervous, reading to thirty kids sitting on a floor in a sitting room, and I thought that was wonderful. He really, really cared about that. He cared about young people. He cared about young writers. And he, the, the thing he said to me when we set up the children's laureate together um, after a, an evening we drank rather too much wine, and I said, "Well, you're the flaming poet laureate. Why do we have a children's laureate?" And he said, well, "That's a really good idea." He was like that. He'd pick up an idea and he ran with it. And he was the person who really made it all happen. But it was because. He knew that what a child does, whether it's reading or whether it's coming under a farm for a week or whether it's listening to music or going to theatre, it is that enrichment you have when you're really young that is, is, the, is the key to your emotional and intellectual growth. And he got that. And um, because he knew I got that too, we were, we were really good friends. And he was terribly supportive of me when, I, when the writing wasn't going well. And then when Warhorse didn't win well, it, the Whitbread Prize, I, um, he was a great encourager of me then. Extraordinary it didn't win that. The First World War, uh, Private Peaceful, Warhorse obviously, uh, uh, and much more. Um, yeah. we, we, we met over the Via Sacra uh, walk um, 10 years ago. Um, yeah. Your enthusiasm for that which has been so important. Um, Warhorse, what was so special about it? We referred earlier to it being the most successful play in the entire history of the National mm. Theatre. 
Um, what what is what is so special about it? I think honestly, it's because it's the first story I think I wrote where um, everything in it really mattered to me, and it's because of the place I live. I live in this tiny community of eighty people, and I discovered when I moved here, whenever it was, forty five or more years ago, forty seven years ago, that there were three old men living in the village. And um, they'd been to the First World War. That's all I knew. And I met one of them in the pub. And uh, this guy, Will Fellis, he was called, um, told me he'd been to the First World War, as he said, with horses. And I talked to him and talked to him and couldn't get a word out of him for a bit. And then for some reason, and because a lot of people are quite like this down here. They don't necessarily like to talk, particularly about things they really care about. They keep it to themselves. And he kept this to him. So his wife told me later he'd never spoken about it. He talked to me for two hours in front of the fire in the Duke of York in Italy, all about being at that war, age 17, and what had happened to him, and the horse that he loved more than life itself, he said, my best friend, and he meant it, and he wasn't being sentimental. And I suddenly realized this was a whole aspect of war I didn't know anything about, so I did a lot of research, and I found out, I found out that about a million horses um, went to that war, uh, and 65,000 came back, which is roughly the same number in terms of losses, the number of men who went from here. And then, of course, there are seven graves, um, seven names on the war memorial in this tiny little village. And I just had this sense that from here, from the cottage I'm living in, I know the man called Farley, who walked away from this cottage in 1914 and didn't come back. This was the last place door he walked out of. And you just know this landscape grew these people these are the people who made the hedges who grew the trees and it um it touched me enormously and it meant a lot to me and i think that's why the story has worked because um it meant a lot to me and i think it means quite a bit to people who read it um i also wanted to do something a bit daring which was to write a story about an animal but in the first person i know it had been done in black beauty um so i knew it could be done but it was important to do it without it being sentimental because there is nothing Nothing sentimental about war. Let's go straight into to questions. And the first question here is from Joshua from a local school called Royal Latin. And you partly answered Joshua's questions. How do you research the history for your books? Uh, do you ask people who've been in the situation? So I think um, we perhaps answered Joshua. Yes, I think, I mean, um, hello, Joshua, by the way, if you're there listening, listen, I, I think that research, the first research you do is in your dreams, um, it, because it's of a whole subject of the First World War. The first research I ever did, or I didn't even know I was doing it, was when I was about 15 or 16, and I read the poets of the First World War, Wilfred Owen and C. Richard Soon and Edmund Blunden and people like this. So that I grew up with those poems inside my head. No, that wasn't deliberate research. But when I then got to the situation where I wanted to write a story about a horse in the First World War, it was important to know um, everything about the particular regiment, which was the Devon Yeomanry. So I, I looked all that up. I went to the Imperial War Museum. I asked people. So I was lucky. I, I, was, I, I got to meet the last group of those veterans who were still alive and wanted to talk about it, uh, which was just a, a lucky lucky moment for me and here's the thing it meant so much because i felt as i was doing this research with them that they wanted me to tell their story to pass it on that it really mattered to them as well so i then had a sort of responsibility to get it right not to mess it around so then i went to france and i walked the battlefields in france and i did the same when it came to private peaceful even the name of private peaceful was a in, in a way, it was a lucky accident, but based on research. I wanted to find out about the soldiers who had been shot for uh, cowardice or desertion in the First World War. And um, I went to graveyard after graveyard, and then one day was walking past, it's called the Bedford Cemetery, walked past a, a line of graves, and there was one called Private Peaceful. I thought, well, this is the name, this is the name, that's it. And then I, I went to the museum, there's a wonderful museum there, if it interests you, in a place called Ypres called In Flanders Field. And I went and talked to the man who ran it and uh, for, for Private Peaceful. Um, I was researching this already because I had discovered that hundreds and hundreds, literally, of soldiers were shot for cowardice or desertion in the First World War. Uh, and 
I asked him when I was there, do you know anything about these people? And he said, well, actually, I can show you some of their trials. So he took me down to the basement of his place, and I looked at the trials, and I read one of them aloud. He took, last, let me take a sort of facsimile of it back to my hotel room. And I read it aloud. It lasted for 18 minutes for a man's life. And you, you have to write stories when you find out these sort of things in your research. So that's what I do. I ask the people who were there, if I can, then the people who are experts on it, um, read around it myself, um, go to the places as well. So immerse myself in it is the answer. And Megan says, do you ever suffer, Michael, from writer's block? And what's the hardest bit you find in putting a story together? Well, the two questions are, are linked. I've never had writer's block in my life. Um, 140 and novels, it, it would be tough. <laughs> I think, and, and I, I, I think you know, Ted Hughes is responsible for this because I remember at some point I was having trouble in the middle of writing Warhol, and uh, I expected some sympathy for him. I said I'm a bit of a, a, bit of a I got a bit stuck, and he, he looked at me and said, "Well, you shouldn't have got stuck." He's quite firm about it. I said, well, "What do you mean you shouldn't have?" He said, "Well, the thing is uh, that when you're writing a poem or you're writing a novel, it doesn't matter which, you don't sit down and tell it down on the page." until you have the idea so not so well formed that you know what's going to happen but you're so immersed in it that you can't stop writing it um, because what you mustn't do is to be hesitating and hesitating and hesitating there must be a flow and then he said he said that there's a there comes a time when you've done all your research and you've dreamt it all out he called it dream time as well as i do now and he said that there does come a moment when you actually got to stop all that and you sit down and with the confidence that you have this story, the people, the place in your head, then you tell it down onto the page and do it in the way which is uninhibited. Let the story flow out. And then you won't get um, writer's block. And I, I never have. And that's not something I, I'm patting myself on the back. It's just that I've taken that advice. I don't sit down and write until I'm really ready to do it. Um, and, then it and then it flows through. And I... I don't know, I never know what's going to happen at the end of one of the stories that I write, never. I try to let the story help tell itself, and I think that's really important, because then the reader won't know the end as well. <laughs> A question from Lila, uh, who says, what inspired you to write Casper, Prince of Cats? Well, that's funny. Lila, um, nice to speak to you. I, I wrote that, um, <laughs> this just sounds bizarre, uh, after foot and mouth disease here, um, but we decided, Claire and I, we got the wrong side of, the, I think, 60 by that time. Um, look, actually, we need some younger people here to help run this uh, farm for city children. And so we have one or two other people here with us. And we didn't have to be on the farm every day as we had been for 25, 30 years. So uh, a letter came. And the letter was from a hotel in London called the Savoy Hotel. Some of you listening will uh, maybe know this place. Um, it's a very, very smart hotel in the centre of London, and they wrote saying, would you like to come for three months and stay in the hotel and be our writer in residence? So here I was, shut down in the countryside for decades and decades, and someone was saying, would you like to come and live in a hotel, quite a decent hotel too, in the centre of London, and be a writer in residence, and give you know, talks of poetry and this sort of thing to different people. So we said yes, and uh, off we went and we stayed in this hotel, and we learned there was a cat called Caspar. And you can go and see this for yourself. I'm not telling you a fib. Walk into the Savoy Hotel. You'll see a, a guy there with a top hat. Just say hello politely and say, I want to see Caspar. And walk into the door, and you'll see a black, a small black statue out of wood, jet black statue, and that is Caspar. And he's sort of, I don't know what you call him, he's, a, he, he, he's the sort of emblem of the, um, of the Savoy Hotel. And so there was that cat, there was the Savoy Hotel, there was the Royal Opera House just up the road, and a story about a, a lady opera singer who stayed at the Savoy, and a cat, and a bellboy started coming into my head. And then I had this extraordinary moment, walking down into the place where you have breakfast. It looked like a picture I'd seen. And I thought, I know this, I know this, I've seen it before. It's one of those deja vu things. And it was, in fact, I went back to the book that I remember, it was the dining room of the Titanic. And so I thought, this is too good to be true. I'm going to write a story about the cat that was on the 
Titanic. And uh, that's how Caspar came to be. <laughs> but if, if you do go up to the Savoy, please go and stroke Caspar from me and say hello. Martin says, how hard is it to adjust your different writing uh, for different kinds of books, from children's books to war stories? And I don't make any difference at all. I don't think of an audience at all. Um, it doesn't matter if I'm, I mean, that, that uh, little prose poem I read you at the beginning, I didn't write that for anyone, I wrote it for me. Um, I think it will, may well be a picture book with a well, a wonderful illustrator later on, but what a, what a publisher makes of it is, that's up to the publisher. So as I'm saying, I just tell it. And uh, I tell it really as if I'm telling it to myself. And here's the thing, I've been a child, surprisingly. You might, you might think I haven't been, but I have been. And um, the child is still in me, and it's alive and well and kicking, thank you. And that's very important, I think. So I write for me, and I'm now an old man. I'm a grandfather and a great-grandfather, and I write the story for that me as well. I just tell the story to me, and I hope there's an audience out there. But it's not a contrived thing. Um, so if I'm telling a story that's really serious, it's like Private Peaceful, I will tell it in exactly the same way as I would if I wrote The Butterfly Lion, which is supposedly for uh, younger children. But it isn't for younger children. It's, it's, um, it's for whoever reads it. And uh, Paco, Toby, Leo and Ang Harrod uh, said, could you um, give us an idea where you come up with one of the ideas? Talk about another story uh, that you've written and where that idea came from. I can. I wrote a book called Kensky's Kingdom, which maybe one or two of you have read. I do hope so. If not, I'll be really cross. Um, <laughs> but Kensky's Kingdom um, was, again, I think it grew early out of, um, Robert Louis Stevenson. I've always been fascinated by islands. I go on holiday to the Isles of Scilly. I've written book after book of the Isles of Scilly, the wreck of the Zanzibar, oh, all sorts. Um, and anyway, islands, islands, I'm, I'm fascinated by. And I read a story, this is what happens, I read a story in a newspaper. And it was a story about a Japanese uh, soldier um, who, after the Second World War, when it was over in 1945, he, along with a few others in other islands, but this is the only guy left on this island, he refused to believe that Japan had lost the war. And he decided not to try to get off the island. So he stayed on this island. This is absolutely true. He stayed there for 27 years. Uh, now, uh, Robinson Crusoe was on his island four years. And that was a bit of a fiction. This is a Japanese guy who was there for 27 years. And then I thought, well, hang on, this man must have really become the island, the spirit of the island. To have survived that long, he lived off the land. He was in harmony with the whole place. And then I heard uh, at the end of the story, I read at the end of the story, uh, that he had been discovered, uh, actually by a, a Japanese yacht and taken back, and he later became an MP in Japan. It was an extraordinary, extraordinary story. So I thought to myself, what would be really interesting was to have a boy from here, this country, um, to somehow get onto that island and be with that man. I didn't know how to do it, didn't know how to do it. And this is what happens. Something I went to, to, to a drinks party down here. Um, and I'd just been thinking about this island and this Japanese uh, uh, soldier and thinking, you know, child, I wanted a child on this island. And I got talking to someone, not about that at all. Um, it was one of those awful conversations. And, and I said to, to this man I met, who I wasn't particularly interested in meeting, I said to him, um, what do you do? That's what people say to each other at these parties. I said, what do you do? And he said, well, I said, I don't think I've been sailing around the world <laughs> on a yacht with my wife for the last five years because I lost my job six or seven years ago. We didn't know what to do with ourselves, so we sold the house, sold the car, bought a yacht, and my wife and I sailed around the world. And I said, what, just the two of you? And he said, no, with our son. Really? I said, just the son? No, he said, and the dog. And suddenly I had a, I had a story in my head. I had a dog, I had a boy, I had a yacht, fall off the yacht, swim, swim, swim. Parents sail off into the darkness because you have to get rid of parents in these stories. And he's on the island with his dog and his football and this Japanese soldier. And it's called Kensky's Kingdom. That's really the way these stories happen. It's, it's happy accident. And by leaving such wide options open that magical things can happen. 
and uh, wonderful. Uh, James from St Gregory the Great School in Oxford actually asked that same question there. So we'll move on to Sue. You might not like this question, Michael. She says, what do you consider to be your greatest work? Writers often don't like that question. Um, well, I do actually, um, because it's not a book at all. It's this thing, Farms for City Children, which is by far my, it's my best story by far. I wrote it with my wife, Claire. So we've, this is a combined authorship, if you like, to make this charity, which is a living, breathing thing that's gone on for 45 years. And um, it's a story that um, is, has been our life. And we've lost ourselves in it, buried ourselves in it. Um, and it's still a great joy to us. It's a great sadness at the moment because we're shut down and we're facing funds like crazy to get it set up again. But once it's up and running again, the story will go on. And what's wonderful about this particular story is that in a way, every child who comes here is making her or his own story out of it. Because the experience of being on a farm for a week, particularly if you live in the middle of a city somewhere, is so extraordinary and so dramatic that it stays with you for the rest of your life. It's hugely, hugely enriching. I know that because the teachers tell us, the parents teach, uh, tell us, and I tell you what happens now. I mean, sometimes when we're not shut down like this, I go to um, book festivals or I go to bookshops or something and someone comes up to me, I look up and there's this big man about six foot four and he looks down at me and he says, are you, are you Michael Morpurgo? I said, yes. He said, well, you made me muck out a calf shed something like 35 years ago when I was a little boy and this man's <laughs> trailing along four little boys and the wife of his own. And then he says, it was just the greatest week of my life. I just had this extraordinary, extraordinary experience. I've never forgotten it. I haven't forgotten the smell either. But I mean, it's that kind of a moment, you know, really works. So that's my, that's my greatest book. Uh, and uh, that allows me just to say, do if you are able um, to provide any support, particularly this time for farms and city children, there's information about how to do it. It, it, it is such a great, great charity. Now, Eloise uh, and Olivia, amongst quite a few, Sicily, uh, um, amongst others, are not quite letting you get away with that. They're now specifying, Michael, what is your favourite book uh, that you've written? Who are, these, who, are, who are these deeply unpleasant children? What are they called again? <laughs> they're called Eloise, Cicely, Olivia. They're quite a number, actually, all wanting to do it, to, to ask what your favourite book. And, and also, uh, Ibad is saying, um, and how do you keep the story interesting? That's a good question. <laughs> well, they're two different stories. All right, I'll tell you my favourite story. All right, that's the best thing to do. My favourite story is pretty well always the one I just finished. Um, and that's not telling a fib. And the one I've just finished is the one I've just read you, um, Song of Gladness. And it means so much to me, that little story. I know it's only a little story. It's not War and Peace. But then I'm not Tolstoy. It's just something I'm very, very fond of. And I knew when I wrote it that I loved it. So that's my favorite. But if I put my hand on my heart, the book that has been kindest to me, that I've become fondest of, I suppose, is War Horse. Um, my wife loves it. She loves horses. And she always says it's my her favourite book, uh, which annoys me because I've written about 70 books since that one and none of the others haven't been her favourite book. But there we are. You've got to go along with it. But I love it because she loves it. I love it because so many people have loved it. Also, I was lucky enough to be around when they were making the play of it at the National Theatre. And um, since then, I know, what is it, over 7 million of people worldwide have seen this extraordinary play. And I... I've been on the stage and I've dressed up and I've joined in it from time to time. And I love working with these actors, being with them and to see the passion that they've got for it, the devotion to the work and making this the most extraordinary show, certainly the National Theatre have ever done. And it's changed the way we look at puppets. There are these, some people I hope listening may have, may have seen it, but there are these extraordinary puppets, life-size, bigger than life-size, um, horse puppets and crows and, and the whole stage is inhabited by by soldiers and by horses and it's unbelievably moving the music is extraordinary and so i i, I know that the story of war horse began that and that gives me enormous pleasure yes and there are um so many questions about war horse um 
What about the film uh, and how you felt about that and how involved you were? Well, um, the film came, bizarrely, came from the stage play. I mean, what's interesting is the book, hardly anyone was reading it before they made um, the play of it. 25 years, the book really sat there hardly selling a copy. And suddenly the National Theatre made this play and, and then everyone was reading the book and it was interesting, which was just one of those wonderful surprises and accidents, nothing I did. It was just, just happened because a man called Tom Morris in the National Theatre decided he would direct this extraordinary play in the way that he did. And then um, walking in off the street was a, a wonderful producer from Hollywood called Kathy Kennedy, who happened to be Steven Spielberg's producer. She walks in off the street because she's with her daughter and her daughter likes horses and they go and see it and she's blown away, as so many people are by the production, rings up um, Steven Spielberg outside the theatre and says, look, you've got to come and see this. So he flies over in a few days, goes to see the play and says, I'm making a film of this. Um, it's interesting. I was more distant from the film. I went to see it being shot here and there. Um, I found it harder to understand what was going on because it's so bitty to making a film. There's so much waiting around. But I was fascinated to watch it. It's truer, I have to say, to the book um, than the play is. There's no doubt about that. It, uh, it's got the same sort of uh, pattern, really, uh, to the plot. Um, and he filmed it in Devon, which was wonderful, not in my village, which I wanted him to do, but he didn't. Um, I think the war scenes are quite, quite extraordinary. I find some parts of the film which are to do with agriculture, whether uh, or the pastoral bits, the people living in the countryside, the farmers, not as convincing as the, um, the war scenes. But I love the acting. It was out of this world. They've just got terrific people to do it. So now I was really, really lucky. And, and then suddenly, of course, um, the book is a bestseller, which it absolutely wasn't. Um, so I have to thank Mr. Spielberg for that, which I do wholeheartedly. And lots of questions in from Warrener and uh, school at uh, Denby uh, School. And um, I just, um, Leona, I'm going to make the last uh, uh question what is the toughest criticism uh that's a hard one uh given to you and um uh, and do do you care how much do you care about what what is said about your books um the toughest criticism was a review in a newspaper called the guardian i don't know if you've heard this newspaper but um i did never buy it it does terrible reviews of things and um, anyway, it was of a book of mine called Twist of Gold, um, which I wrote just after War Horse, and everyone was expecting the next one to be a wham bam success because this had, um, had got some critical acclaim, War Horse. But out came this book, and um, anyway, it was it was a rather difficult criticism in the sense that um, it felt I hadn't treated uh, the whole situation of black people in America as well as I should have done, um, which was wrong. I was writing at a time where uh, there were slaves there, and I wrote about them as if they were slaves, which is not easy to do um, if you're writing a book which children are going to read, because there are some people who think that if you if you portray black people like that, you're doing them a disservice. Actually, you're not. You're telling the truth about why we have the situation that we have, whether it's America or here. It's, it's deep, deep down in how black people were treated for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, but there we are. It was there, and I felt it was rather cruel, and I've... Um, uh, so that hurts. Um, but do you know what? I was young then. And now I, it sounds awful. This is not arrogance. I don't care anymore. It's not because I don't think you're, you know, you're, you should be criticized. You should be. That's a, a really legitimate way of, of, of dealing with the arts. And you have to do it. And I take these things on board. But I don't mind like I mind. Because I know I do my best with each book or play or film. I love it if people like the films and like the plays because I can see the pleasure it gives to the people who are acting in them. It's really hard if you're making a film or you, you made a film or you made a play and the critics have been really hard on it. It's very, very hard to go onto the stage the next day. And I feel for them. Um, but no, now I'm 75, I sort of think, well, you've done your best, get on with the next one and don't worry about it. And we're going to have to finish there. Um, there have been uh, just under 100 uh, questions. I'd like to thank everybody who's asked uh, questions uh, and I, I, I'm sorry 
uh, that I didn't get round to all of them, uh, but um, I, I tried to find ones that hadn't been asked uh, before. They were extraordinary. Uh, Michael, I think we'll send them to you. They're wonderful uh, questions from uh, love to see them. Yeah. Uh, 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 principally uh, young people. Uh, and just to say what an incredible uh, privilege uh, that was and pleasure to listen to you. Uh, and thank you, Michael Morpurgo, from everybody at the University of Buckingham, uh, from everybody in this community, from all the schools uh, far and wide who've been listening into this. Uh, they would have learned uh, a great deal about the process of, of writing, that creative process, the importance of storytelling, uh, of um, belief uh, in the importance of the written and spoken word. Uh, it was profoundly moving uh, listening to you and from all of us, Michael Morpurgo, thank you very, very much indeed. And thanks to Claire also and all the work. Anthony, thank you so much for inviting me and I hope one day I can come to the place and, and be there um, in person and, and meet some of the people who've um, who sent in such um, extraordinarily interesting questions. And I send you my best wishes from a green and pleasant land that is Devon at the moment. <laughs> Thank you, Michael.